Hey everybody, it's your girl Cache coming at you with another video. Today I am doing yet another masterclass. This time in preparation for the things that I plan on writing during camp, during nano, just things that I need to get done in order to get where I want to get. For those of you guys who don't know, I am trying with my novels to focus on mystery, thriller, and suspense. That's kind of like what I love to read, what I love to watch, and it's what I'm going to be attempting thing to try to both self-publish and traditionally publish so um as you guys know april camp i worked on blankets and burglary and i got somewhere may hit had a little uh you know had death in the family I had different things going on that way and so was like okay i'm gonna try this again for july camp and so in preparation for july camp i took along with my good friend truly tash um, I will link her channel in the description box below as well as her video. I'm super duper excited like ah, my first international collab, international collab. Of course, you know, we got the Naked Firefly in Germany and Oman Roll in the UK and Tash lives in Australia. So I'm super duper excited about this and to get into it. So you guys, David Baldacci has written over 40 books um standalone series in the suspense thriller genre and so we decided to take his master class and so i'm going to take you guys through it so let's get started writing isn't a job or an occupation or a hobby it's a lifestyle so for all of you out there it has to be something you incorporate in your life as you go through your daily routine i get ideas from waking up in the morning and walking out the door and I look at the world through a writer's prism, as I call it, I sort of cocked a little bit, and I see everything that everybody else sees, but what I look through and I look at the potential of what could be out there if I sort of add a little pixie dust, fictional pixie dust to something. You can't just see what's out there in black and white. That's what everybody else does. And those people are not going to be writing novels or screenplays or anything. They just see the world and they forget it and move on. Your job is to see the world and then realize the potential of what is out there every single day. So I am through the first couple of videos and some things that uh, Mr. Baldacci said that like stuck out to me. Um, it kind of also was reminiscent to things that MK was saying in the master class that I took with both uh, Becca and Kate uh, last week. So um, he talks about the writer's prism and saying that writing is a lifestyle. You must be receptive to what the world gives you, then filter it through your creative lens or writer's prism and so like again this is something that we all know because as writers we do this but again what i've been realizing from taking these master classes is there's something about writers being able to word the things that i have not been able to put into words that i am like very appreciative and thankful for and in this one i was like okay well for the projects that I have going, so I have Blankets and Burglary, which it will be a cozy mystery. And then I have the Dexter Meets How to Get Away with Murder, which would be a suspense thriller duology. And then I have a lake, uh, a lake project, which would be more supernatural or paranormal suspense and thriller. Like, it's going to definitely have some magic realism uh, aspects into it, I believe. Um, I'm still trying to work on 
on that and those won't be projects that I start until the fall hits but I'm realizing that for me to be able to do the novels that I want to do it's going to take preparation and back to the NK class she said that she does like a month's worth of research so I'm going to be using the time before I start on the novels to research and to plan and to do better about the world building and things so um but one thing that he says is there needs to be a puzzle and a mystery and thriller like there has to be a puzzle there has to be something to solve and it doesn't necessarily have to be a crime per se it just needs to be something that the reader is solving along with the story so one thing that he said to do is to write about what you're passionate about. And I wrote down a few things that I'm passionate about and that I realize are very pertinent to the stories that I write because there is some aspect of them in each one. And so um, we had equity with races. Notice I said equity, not equality. Um, there's an image that I'm going to put into the video for you guys to see that explains for me, the difference between equity and equality, just so that you guys see where I stand on that. Um, good black fathers and good black female friendships. So in everything that I write, like there has to be a good black father, there has to be good black female friendships. Because those are things that I feel like sometimes are not emphasized in stories. They are not emphasized in media and I want to do my part to change that. Um, he also talked about uh, research and he says sometimes you have to do the things you write about to feel it and this also brought me back to N.K. Jemison, who went actually to Hawaii and like walked to where volcanoes had been or like had erupted like touched the touched the the ash touched it felt it because she needed to put herself in that place to be able to understand and to be able to accurately describe the things she wanted to describe so this does make me want to go visit this lake that I am writing about that's based on like a real lake. But also y'all, and black people saying that they live there and they don't go there, I also don't want to go there. Is my thought. Is my thought. Y'all know me. I'm scary. I don't do ghosts. I don't do... And it's a, it's a lot of talk about how haunted this lake is. And so like, I'm like... You know, there's plenty of lakes in Oklahoma. I'm going to just go to one and just, like, take pictures and videos and work on that. So, yeah, y'all, that's where I got from that. Um, and so, one thing that he talks about is that he doesn't own any guns. But he has shot every gun ever made to be able to talk about that experience when describing that shot and that i thought was just amazing one that you went and you took out the time to do that especially if you're not like even the type of person to like buy guns you're not even a gun enthusiast this is simply for research so i like that he did that it made me like it made it put things into perspective for me that there is going to be money that you shell out to if you want to do these things right.
Okay, y'all. So, um, this was like the light bulb moment, and it honestly got me to thinking about how I'm going to go through and restart blankets and burglaries. Also, the first line for the Dexter Meets How to Get Away with Murder. Like, y'all, I got it. I'm super duper excited. I can't wait for y'all to see it. But one thing that he said was your first chapter is the most important chapter um to think about when you're writing you need to think is it a is this chapter a bridge to something am i driving the plot forward am i conveying information am i deepening the character if it doesn't do this you don't need the chapter um this especially hit home for me because i was thinking back to when i was going through with my critique partners on jesus never went to college and shout out to my critique partner dejana because she was like yo like i like what you have but um you could speed this up a little bit like mm, it's good but like where is it going what is it doing and so when I was thinking about blankets and burglaries and I was thinking about where I start the story versus what happens, it's like, it is dragging a little bit because I was getting frustrated writing it like, dang, when do I get to, hey, they stole this money from the garage sale. So, that is what has made me decide that the stealing from the garage sale happens sooner um, and is more so where the start of the story is. Uh, so that's where I'm getting for that. So I'm excited. One thing he said about chapter ch chapters is short chapters are like quick jabs to the face. It heightens the importance of the chapter. High stakes is also important. important. Good thrillers always have good mysteries. Um, loss always leads to retribution. So when he said that, I wrote down for the stories what is being lost. Um, and so for Blankets and Burglaries, Torrance's Gift, um, Sharice's Summer Freedom, um, just so many different things are being affected by the fact that one, someone steals from the garage sale, but also someone steals from her friends that live in the senior village. Um, so there's that. He said... To focus on ticking clocks, they are important. To having something that can't lapse can increases the urgency of the story. Um, writer, and one thing that he said that I love, he says, writers must be magicians. It's, I'm telling you this, and I'm giving you misdirection. You don't see what I'm doing with this hand because you're so involved with what's going on here. And so it's like, if I am making sure the reader is so involved in the frustration and the irritation and the struggle that Sharice is going through dealing with how this is affecting her family and her workplace then the misdirection of the other suspects and the things that I'm doing over here won't be as out there so I was like okay I like that be a magician be a magician so there's that so those are the types of things you have to think about right that's why I said writers have to be writers magicians because you know the red herring over here and but I have to show it you know but but I want you to focus on it too much I do something really interesting over here and you look over there and then it's gone that's the kind of you know, response you listen from that would be like I never saw that one coming
An instant later, the wooden front door was thrown back, the knob punching a crater in the drywall, and the glass door was kicked open so hard that it hit the metal banister on the left side of the porch, shattering the glass. Howard Reed jumped from the top step to the dirt. His heels dug in. He gave one shudder, sank to his knees, and threw up what little was left in his stomach. Then he rose and stumbled to his truck, coughing, retching, and yelling in terror like a man suddenly deranged. And he was. Howard Reed would not make it to the dollar bar today. And the dollar bar was a place he was going to go have a drink after he finished his last round of, of mail delivery, and that, that was it. So with that, you understand that the main question is, what in the hell did this guy see in the house that caused that reaction from him? And, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I, if you don't read the next chapter after reading that ending, then I, I have nothing to give you. <laughs> because it's just, you know, there's nothing else I can have in my arsenal that would entice you. Okay guys, so he was talking about roller coaster rides and cliffhangers and I got so excited. He was saying that in a book, a thriller, mystery, suspense, anything, stuff can't happen all the time. Uh, but Archie talked about watching a movie in which there was always something going on and watching the movie gave him so much anxiety he couldn't finish it and I personally I have felt that way with some of like the black horror shows that have been for some people who are primarily not black they might not see and feel the horror and the intensity that I do when I watch them but when I watch them like there are some shows where I can only I, I, I can't watch multiple episodes of um but one thing he says is take a breath chapter have take a breath chapters slow it down there needs to be a lull organic combo reinforcing all the points of the case this helps to clarify for both the reader the writer and the main character right so if you are reiterating the clues reiterating what you found out reiterating the character's assumptions it helps to cement the things that have happened that the reader may have forgotten about or may not have thought was important but the main character did or whatever else there needs to be then y'all he talks about cliffhangers now me I love a good cliffhanger because a good cliffhanger makes me want to read the next one, watch the next one, see the next one, whatever. And so he talks about not leaving cliffhangers in books, but leaving cliffhangers in chapters. And y'all, the like light bulb started going off. Your girl was like, I finally, I know what I want to do. So he says, leave something unresolved to create anticipation. Pause mid-scene, but be particular. Ending with a scene that gives enough anticipation that something is about to happen makes the reader continue reading. The most important parts to a chapter is how it starts and how it ends. Alright, when Badachi was talking about making memorable characters, one thing he said is flaws. Deepening character traits give you gives you plot elements. There needs to be something that happens to the character whenever they do something as far as your villain goes. Or the person that might be the anti-hero of the story. Because like in the Dexter Get Me How to Get Away with Murder, 
Um, I feel like the main character is, she is strong in her resolve. She agrees with what she's doing. She's not crazy. She's not insane. She thinks everything she's doing is perfectly all right. And that it is the best way to solve the problem that she has. I think in this and recognizing that about her, I still need to make sure that I'm giving her some, uh, some type of humanity in the killing that she does. Is that there's an emphasis on good people who still do awful things. That not all villains are doing things because they are bad people or they have bad motives. Sometimes bad things come from the desire to do something good for somebody other than themselves. So one of the other things that he's talked about that really stood out to me had to do with going back through and like editing and revising your draft and it actually reminded me of some tips and tricks that Natalia Lee had given last year during the um during the Evergreen Writing Oasis. I will link the video that she did for that in the description box below um and she talked about how you can outline after you finish the draft and like go back and outline to make sure that you're hitting you hit the points that you wanted to during the story and things like that and so what he says is he's talking about pacing and he says check your pacing chapter by chapter a sentence description per chapter and make sure the order makes sense fresh eyes matter take some distance from the manuscript sometimes aiming for perfect will make it worse they're going to edit your book anyway that stuck out to me because so many times I think that on the writer space in YouTube that we have, we talk so much about perfectionism and getting it perfect and getting it perfect and not having it perfect by the time that we're querying. And what's perfect to us for querying most definitely will not be perfect to the people that are buying the book when you go on submission there are going to be things that they want to change there are going to be things that they're going to feel like need to be better could be better need to be changed there are going to be characters that they don't like there are going to be characters that they think should be cut there are going to be things they think you should go deeper in and because of those things being facts it means that you have to take the time to understand that you're not going to get it all right the first time. So don't stress yourself out not to. That does not mean, pay attention y'all, that does not mean not to try your best. That does not mean not to work really hard on the draft you do put out for querying. But it does mean that you have to learn to let go. Just saying. It wasn't me. It was Dave Baldacci. Not not me. Don't don't come for me. This is what he said. You gotta learn to let go. All right, so for the end of the class, it started to slow down quite a bit for me. Like, I'm not going to lie, y'all. Like, I was dragging. Like, y'all see the yarn? Like, oh. At, towards the end, he goes more into, like, life as a writer, how to build relationships, what to do with booksellers, things like that. Um, but one thing that he talked about that I don't think I've ever heard 
was having relationships with booksellers he talks about going to bookstores and talking to the people there and things like that the first black um self-published author i met was in dallas texas and he was doing live events at half price books now y'all know me i love me some cheap i don't care about used books like i think used books have character so it doesn't bother me but i love me some half price books like love 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 and so i knew that that was always something i wanted to do like i always knew that whenever i put a book out no matter how i did i wanted to contact different half price books because of my love for the establishment to do you know live book signings and things like that um and so he talks about that like he talks about going to barnes and noble he talks about going to you know indie booksellers he talks about there was one place that sold 1500 copies of his book also let me start there that conversation in the video Help me to see that like selling thousands of copies isn't as easy as it may sound and or seem. Like he was quick to like talk about this 1500 copies from this one bookseller. And to me I was just like that's less than 2000 copies right but that is still a lot of copies and so it told it, it it helped me to see that one my mindset on like the actual number of book sales was very skewed from what like i've seen on like book covers like over 40 million sold and da -da -da, like things like that also forgetting that the books that i've seen that out have been out for decades so it makes sense that they have that but it definitely was like a clarification moment for me while I was doing this. Um, the name, the, the 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 last thing that I got from this that I want to share with you guys is rejection is a part of life. Don't ever let it stop you from going for your dreams. If you keep doing what you love and you're never bored during it, doing it, you've done it. You're successful. And he says that to say that had he never sold absolute power, had absolute power just not ever been what it ended up being and the launching pad for his career, he would still be writing because writing is what he loves and it's what he wants to do. And he talked about how before he decided to work on the novel, he had written a screenplay and he was he was this is why he was still a lawyer he had written a screenplay and it looked like it was going to sell like everybody wanted it and then warner brothers or time warner one of the two passed on it and because they passed on it um everybody else passed on it and so he felt like man like maybe i can't do this maybe this isn't something but he kept going and for me that meant a lot because Y'all, I, I, I know that I can do short stories. I've been doing short stories um, now consistently for over a year. And I've been like getting the drafts and getting the editing and getting through. And I have been feeling real discouraged because I have not for the life of me been able to finish a novel. Um, and it's not because the ideas aren't there. A lot of time it is my own perfectionism, um, my own mental health and self-doubt, and then not feeling like I adequately have the skills to do what I need to do.
All right, y'all. Now we have went through my one, two, three, four, my four pages front and back of notes on this masterclass. Here are my final thoughts. I do think that if you are writing mystery and thrillers that you will be able to get something out of this. Um, I do think that if you are someone who is wanting to know about um, what he has had to do publishing, like as far as advertising, as far as getting himself out there, as far as advocating for himself, I do think the like ending half of the class is important. Personally, I did find the ending videos to drag. I feel like the fervency in which he spoke and in which he gave the information was not the same. And so because of that, I it, I did struggle to get through the second half of the videos. Um, but I am glad that I took the master class. It definitely gave me brand new ways to start all the mystery thrillers that are currently in my head, currently in my Trello board and all that good jazz. And so um, I'm definitely glad I took this class. Um, now, what I do know is... He has an over 90 page workbook and not one but two copies of two different outlines for two different novels that he wrote um, that are extra things. And so me and Tash are going to work through those, go through those in a separate part two video. And so I honestly do think that doing those I will get even more out of the overall class than what I did from the videos. Um, but again, like I said, it is a class that I would recommend if you are wanting to get into the suspense mystery thriller genre. Um, I do think that you are going to hear some things that are just going to make things in your story click. Um, because I know that it happened for me. I know that Tash got something out of it, although I've not seen her video yet and I cannot wait to watch it. Um, so don't forget to look down in the description box below. Check out her channel, check out her video, like, comment, and subscribe. Show us some love and we will be hitting y'all with part two soon. I want to thank you guys so much for taking the time out to watch this video. If you've done a master class, tell me about it. If you've done this master class, definitely tell me about it. If you're working on a suspense mystery thriller, hey, I need more suspense mystery thriller connections in my life. So definitely reach out to me so that we can connect. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye.